You're in a better place I've heard a thousand times And at least a thousand times I've rejoiced for you But the reason why I'm broken The reason why I cry Is how long must I wait to be
Two split mile, Bob. I'm going to leave this microphone with coffee breath. All right. I am Bob Jesperson. I am the new office manager here at Bedford Acres Christian Church. And oh, thank you very much. But uh, I am. Um, I would say I'm taking over for Gina Mulholland, but that would be a uh, not quite correct. There's no way I could take over for what she's done for this church, and I think we should give her a hand. And I have to say that Gina is a terrific teacher. Is she here? She usually sits over here somewhere. Okay, right there. You know what, you can't see very well up here with all these lights coming in my eyes. So if you haven't noticed, too, I'm kind of a senior citizen, so if I don't see you or I don't remember your name, um, just give me a little grace and, and I'll, I'll get there eventually. Hopefully before the Lord comes. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm here to do announcements. So again, bear with me as I learn this job and uh, I, I took care of the bulletin for you all, and guess what? The very first line is incorrect. There is not a missions meeting today. Instead, it's being postponed, uh, a date yet to be determined, and you'll hear more news about that. So if you're in the missions committee or you want to be a part of that missions uh, meeting, it's not happening today. Now, let's get on with the most important announcements. First of all, if you're a guest here, we're really glad you're here. And we have a gift for you, and it's back at the Information Center or sometimes called the Welcome Center. Or anyway, it's, it's out there. There's a counter. You'll see it. So um, I will figure out what it's called next week or the next time I do these announcements. Also, oh, it's Welcome Center? OK, all right. It's, a, it's the Welcome Center. But you'll find your gift back there. And uh, uh, we're really happy that you're here if you're a guest with us. And also, please let us know you're here, whether you're a guest or you're a regular attender. Uh, there are cards in the back of your seats right in front of you uh, that you can use. Or if you're a regular member here, you should have that uh, uh, church center app on your phone. So use that to check in. It, it helps us know that you're here and connect with you even better. And on the back of those cards, if you have some prayer requests and that, please be sure and jot those down. And we'll, we'll uh, put that in our, our prayer request list. All right. Then I also want to let you know that our, our sermon series continues to be the boot camp. And we have T-shirts out at the Welcome Center still for sale for uh, their $13 each. 
And if you'd like to be a part of this boot camp, the t-shirts are really cool. It's that drab green. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very simple t-shirt to wear and let everybody know that you're part of our, our uh, community here. So, more announcements. We're now into uh, day seven of our 21 day um, fasting challenge. And I know many of you have um, signed up and are doing that. And I, for one, am really enjoying it and finding it really worthwhile and also thinking about food a lot more than I ever have. But every time I think about food, I think about praying to our Lord. And that makes it really well. Uh, it makes it a, a perfect part of our plan. And it's just what the Lord wants us to be doing is to be communing with him. Also, we have our youth team. They are going to be going out and helping at Russell Cave Church, serving food to their youth and, and community. And that's January 23rd. That's a week from this Tuesday. And if you'd like to help and work alongside our youth team, um, you can let Carl Willoughby know that. Also, save the date. Save the date February 4th. That's a Sunday. Sunday evening from 6 to 8 o'clock, we're going to have, actually, our American Heritage Girls are going to be putting together a, a nice dinner for you to bring your date out and have a wonderful dinner prepared by them. And also, we'd like you to bring some friends along, too, if you'd like to have them come and enjoy the date with you. Then, what happens the week after February 4th? What's happening on February 11th? Can anybody yell that out to me? Super Bowl. Yeah, this is a church that likes sports. So, yeah, we've got Super Bowl. If you're interested in hosting, and this worked out really well last year, if you're interested in hosting an uh, in-home Super Bowl party to invite your friends to and make it also a part of an outreach that could help bring your friends to know the Lord, uh, see Dan Giese. He would be the person that can help you set up a really cool Super Bowl party. Now, last but not least, you may have noticed that we've had some weather that has occurred or we've had predictions of weather that could occur and could possibly shut down our church services or our Wednesday night services. If we have inclement weather that would possibly affect our services, you can find that out on Sunday mornings. Check out WKYT TV for our church closings if we're going to close this church service. And if it's Wednesday night, just check out what's happening with the Bourbon Public Schools. If they're closed, we're closed. All right? Okay. I am going to say a word of prayer, and then I'll have you all stand up and greet one another. Thank you very much for your patience with me <laughs> as I've rambled through this. And again, I thank you very much for uh, uh, coming here today. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you very much for this beautiful day that you've given us, this wonderful sunshine. Lord, we appreciate your faithfulness that brings to us yet another day, another opportunity to honor and serve and glorify you. Lord, we pray and thank you for all these people that are here today. I thank you for the wonderful music that we've already heard from our worship team and look forward to worshiping with them and you and our congregation that much more yet today. I pray for Dean's message that it's heard um, by open hearts and it allows us to do all that you want us to do the rest of today and throughout this week. Now I pray that we give you all the glory because everything here comes from you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand up and greet one another. This one's muted. It's green.
It's okay to clap. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, He holds a victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your prayer, oh, 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 we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. Shout out your praise. Oh, 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 we shout out your praise. We were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven.
God's extreme. Night and day, day and night, let incense arise. Really? 24-7? Like the incense in the temple. Let the prayers of the saints, the worship of saints arise. Extreme? There's joy in the house of the Lord. Let's shout out our praise. I'd rather just sing it. Let's not be too extreme. One of the my the story that gets me every year at Christmas. Um, we celebrate Three Kings Day in our house, and uh, because I'm half Latin, and. Uh, Three Kings Day is January the 6th. It's the day that the church is set aside to celebrate the arrival of the wise men to see Jesus. These wise men were extreme. They spent at least two years, thousands and thousands of of money and time and planning, all because they saw a star. That's extreme. So I'm going to go to this little town in a nation I've never been. And I go for one reason, one reason alone. It's to worship him. The Bible says we've come to worship him. And that word means prostrate. Probably something you've never done on a Sunday morning because it's extreme. But they traveled over a thousand miles, spent thousands and thousands of dollars, at least two years away from friends and family and everybody else just to worship because of a star. Because they knew this was the star of a king. And this king wasn't an ordinary king, he was God. They are the first ones in the Bible to recognize that Jesus was God come in the flesh. And there wasn't anything too extreme for these guys. Because there's one thing they had to do in their life, and that was worship the king. Crazy extreme? Yeah. Can you imagine spending thousands of dollars and traveling two years to go to church? That's what these guys did. There's a lady in the Bible who came. Jesus was at the home of a Pharisee. And she comes and she brings an alabaster flask like this, full of perfume. Probably the most expensive possession that she had. And she brings it. And she cries on Jesus' feet and washes his feet with her tears and wipes his feet with her hair and anoints his feet with alabaster, with with perfume from an alabaster flask. Extreme, Pharisee thought so. He says this. He gets on Jesus, and so Jesus answers back to Simon. He says, so you see this woman, this one here? I came to your house. You didn't give me water for my feet. Like a normal person would let you, would give you water to wash your feet. But this Pharisee didn't even show that amount of respect that you would a normal traveler. But she hasn't washed, she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss. You didn't greet me. But this woman hasn't ceased to kiss my feet since I got here. You didn't anoint my head with oil, which would be a sign of honor. But this woman has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Because she loves much. She's extreme. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. You think you're all that? You think you got there? You think you arrived? You think you're a good person? You will not be a person of extreme. This woman who knew she didn't deserve his love, she was extreme. Because when you realize where you came from, what you are, 
and that Jesus loved you anyway and still, then there's no cost too high. There's nothing too extreme. You'll worship with tears. You'll kiss his feet. You'll waste expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. Because that's, that's the way to respond to, G, to God's crazy love for us. The Bible says we're worms. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like that. But compared to God, we are. This is exactly who we are. Just a worm. This is amazing that God loves us worms enough to become a worm. To become one of us. Because he loves you and cares for you. It doesn't matter what you've done, who you are, who you've been. It doesn't matter. He loves you anyway. Because God is extreme in his love for us. Not only to be, does he become a worm, he decides to die for the other worms because he loves us that much. That is the extreme love that we celebrate and we thank and we worship him and we owe him every single thing we have because he gave everything he had. He didn't hold anything back for us. Why would we? That's a God I owe my life to. I owe everything I have to him. Everything. This morning as we drink the juice and the little, the bread, which is really styrofoam. I hate those things. But you know what? It is a symbol of Jesus and his extreme love for you and me. Never, ever, ever let me forget that. Amen? Amen. Lord, you're such an awesome God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Pray with me. Lord, we give you uh, we give you back what's already yours. In giving to you, we acknowledge that everything that we have, that we manage for you, is yours. It's not ours. I'm just the steward. I'm the manager. Lord, I ask and pray that you would give a direction and guidance to the leadership of this church, and not, not just them, but every single member. Lord, that your spirit would guide our ministry, that this money that we give would go to reach Bourbon County and missionaries and places around the world that don't know you, that have no idea how much you really love them. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity just to participate in that. It's in your son's name we pray.
My life is yours. My life is yours. My 
God's people said. Would you be seated? morning. It's good to see you all out. You, you came out and braved the elements today. I didn't know how many we'd have today. Didn't uh, That cold weather, some people just, you know, for different reasons don't make it out, but we're glad that you did. I want to give you a heads up. Next week uh, is the 21st. And it's also going to be Lane's last service with us. Uh, we're thrilled for the opportunity before him, but bummed because, you know, uh, he'll be leaving us. But next week, we're going to do a worship service, kind of like we do on a night of worship, only it's going to be during the day. Uh, you don't, you absolutely do not want to miss next week. It's going to be incredible. Come with your heart prepared for God to speak, and uh, He absolutely will. And so I just want to let you know about that. It certainly fits our series about real worship, and then we'll continue that uh, as we move on to the 28th and beyond. Last Sunday... We began this series that we're calling Real Worship, and we discussed three things last week. We talked about how real worship is, number one, personal, and when it's personal, then it can really bless in the corporate way because it's also corporate, but when we do that, we actually connect with the worship that's in heaven. And this morning, I want us to look again at that worship in heaven and see the example of real worship that we touched on it last week, but I'm going to dig in just a little bit deeper this morning. So in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, we read the same verses we read last week. Uh, it says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two... You remember back in, in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve, uh, Eve pretty much ate us out of house and home. Remember that? She ate the apple, got us kicked out, right? Uh, remember that God put, some people say angel, <laughs> a, with a flaming sword to keep people from getting back in. Guess what? That was a, ser- that was a cherubim. Uh, you remember the, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, maybe you know, haven't read that story lately, but you remember Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, remember those two beings, we sometimes call them angels, that were on top. Their wings came over their head and kind of connected on the top of that, which is called the mercy seat. Cherubim, okay? There's a very interesting and pretty well-known cherubim in the Bible. His name was Lucifer. The thought is, uh, among some theologians, that not only was Satan not just an angel, just a run-of-the-mill angel, he was a cherubim. But he was probably the chief among the cherubim. And he had a job in heaven. And his job in heaven was to lead the host of heaven in worship. What you see here in Isaiah, what you see in the book of Revelation before Satan was kicked out, would have been led possibly by the devil himself before he was the devil. Now, what about seraphim? Because that's what we're talking about here. Seraphim are supernatural beings who were created by God to serve and to worship. Many biblical scholars believe a hierarchy exists among angels. The scripture doesn't make that explicit. The theory is this, that the closer to the throne of God uh, that this individual serves, the higher that ranks. It's that case that in that case, seraphim are among the top ranking of all the celestial beings. The seraphim and cherubim, along with the angels around God's throne, circulate around the throne and keep praising God constantly. Now, that's a long way to get to this. What do we see them doing and how are they doing it? If you look at this picture, while a lot could be said about their worship in heaven, there's one thing I think we just cannot ignore. The fact of the reverence. 
There was this incredible reverence to their worship. Matter of fact, in a spiritual sense, the word reverence for us is the idea of demonstrating that we attach sacred significance to a person or a thing. So how do we worship? How do we do real worship in a way that is also reverent? Okay, and I want to talk about three simple things. Number one, our attitude. What is our attitude? Isaiah chapter six, verse two, the middle of the verse says, with two wings, they covered their faces. By covering their faces, they are showing their humility. They recognize this incredible privilege they have in surrounding the throne of God and giving him praise continually. So how do we do that? How are we to show that reverence in our worship and, and how does that look like in our attitude? Well, let's be honest, folks. I think sometimes we have become a little more cavalier in our worship than maybe than we ought to be. I mean, I'm not saying that we should all, you know, get all stuffy. And I'm not saying the preacher ought to start wearing robes and we ought to have incense and all kinds of formality. I mean, I was raised Baptist and, and uh, you know, Wesleyan. And so we never really went to the higher church kind of stuff. If you if you raised Catholic, you'll understand this. If you raised Episcopal, you understand this. If I were to visit a Catholic church today, I'd be so lost because you know by the time they're standing up, I just figured out you got to stand up and they got to sit back down. I mean, they got all the the prayers, the the things they say. But I'm not saying that's wrong, okay? But I, I know one thing: you got to be in good shape to be Catholic because there's a whole lot. It's aerobic worship, okay? So I'm not saying that's what we need to do. I'm not trying to be critical of them. But, folks, this isn't a baseball game either. You know, this isn't some place where, you know, we're just right in the middle of service and pass the popcorn. Okay, and I'm not saying it's wrong to have a coffee or, or drink a, a, eat a donut and anything. I'm not about that at all. But I think there needs to be a little bit of an attitude maybe challenged here. You know, it's not a ballpark. It's not there. We're, we're being invited into the presence of the King of Kings. I think that's important to know that. Uh, last week, there was at least three of us on this stage this morning uh, that uh, were in court. Uh, Kristen and uh, Kyle and I all got jury duty. <laughs> so last Monday, we're all in court, or maybe it was last Friday. Uh, we're all in the courthouse, in the, in the old courthouse. I mean, there's a couple hundred of us in there. And guess what happens? At one point, there's a guy wearing a uniform up front, and he says this, All rise! Why did he say that? Because Judge Maddox was coming into the courtroom, right? And so guess what? We did. We all rose. You know what else I didn't hear the single time I was in there? I didn't hear the first cell phone ring. I think somebody probably got in trouble if they did, right? I mean, now I'm not saying that it was right or wrong. I mean, that's what we expect when a judge walks into in that official capacity. What do we do? We show respect for that position. Psalm 5 says, because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. I'll tell you one thing, right off the bat, you and I can check our level of reverence simply by our attendance. If we're just hit or miss, then it obviously says this isn't the most important thing that we can do. Uh, Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 10, we talked about this a little bit last week, says some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. God is challenging us to, to be involved, to, to, to come. Uh, I guarantee you, if they hadn't uh, canceled that football game in Buffalo today uh, because of the incredible snow, there'd have been crazy people out there, wouldn't there? You know Why? Because that football game is important to them. I know people that haven't been to this church in years, but yet they haven't missed a Bengals game. They don't miss a Kentucky game. I know some, foolish enough, don't even miss Louisville games. And how about Purdue? Sorry, man. They lost twice this week, didn't they? We've got to pray, got to pray for Don. He, he's, on, he's, he's in a bad way. Kent you says it like this. On the most elementary level, you do not have to go to church to be a Christian. We would agree with that. But... You do not have to go home to be married either. But in both cases, if you do not, you will have a very poor relationship. So let me be clear. As Americans, we like to talk about the freedom of worship that we have, but the government is not the one who ultimately gives us that freedom. 
It's God himself has given you and I the freedom to come and worship him. But as spoiled and entitled consumers with our sometimes take it or leave it attitude, sometimes our attitude about worship is actually a sin. We absolutely need to be serious. Our attitude needs to be one of reverence. We show our, our, our reverence by attitude, and certainly that would include being consistent in our attendance. I'm going to start meddling now. <laughs> the second way I think we show our reverence is our attire. And I guarantee there's some people my age and the Lord going, about time he talked about this, right? Don't say amen yet. <laughs> in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2, third part of that verse, it says, and with two, they covered their feet. Now, that's one of those things in the Bible that says, okay, they covered their feet. Does that mean they had shoes on or socks or whatever? No, they were using their wings. Well, that's a very significant thing in that culture. Dr. Paige Kelly in the Broadman Commentary points out this. He said, covering their feet is a euphemism referring to modesty. Now, while I do think we show reverence for our worship by the way we dress, it may not be what you think. And certainly, if you're my age and older, you might be thinking something that's not what I'm talking about, okay? You realize that it's, it's interesting that uh, dressing formally for church is nowhere in the New Testament? Nowhere. Matter of fact, I'm sure Jesus and his disciples dressed the same as anybody else in that culture. It's never mentioned in Scripture that you should wear a coat and tie to church, or God forbid that you should wear a cowboy hat to church. None of that's in there, okay? I mean, it's in our culture, yes, but it's not in there. Dressing for up for church became popular not until the first half of the 19th century in England, and then later became popular in Europe and America, and this came with the emergence of the middle class. Reason being is before that, only the wealthy had the money for nice clothes, and only the wealthy would go to church dressed to the nines, Okay? It was because of the middle class that, that people could start affording nicer clothes, and they started wearing nicer clothes. Medieval Christians had no common practice of dressing up because only the wealthy could do it. As a matter of fact, as you might find this interesting too, when folks did start dressing up for church, many preachers preached against it. Uh, matter of fact, one of them was Alexander Campbell, uh, one, of the, one of the founding member, uh, leaders in the Christian church. He says this, he said, kings and prophets, the saints and martyrs of the other times were oftener seen in sackcloth and ashes than in the gaudy fashion of a flippant and irreverent age. Their sense of propriety forbade that soul and body should disagree, that the outward man should betray the inward and falsify the state of the mind. The Jews, religion taught men congruity. And especially that the exterior attire should always correspond with the inward plainness and simplicity of the heart. He went on to say this, Christians should dress in the plainest and most unassuming garb, especially when they come before a righteous and holy God in worship. That's kind of different than what we're used to hearing. I mean, we've all been to churches where if you didn't, you know, have a certain dress, you'd feel like you're really out of place. And, and you know... We're going to talk about the other extreme, because I think there can be another extreme there. But our attire should, should say something about us. At first glance, I mean, think about this. Some of you probably said this. I know you've heard it. Uh, someone will say this, some well-meaning believer. If, well, if you met the president, wouldn't you want to dress in your finest clothes? I, honestly, I mean... If I were to meet the, if I was going to go meet the president, yeah, I'd probably dress up, okay? And even though I'm not happy with some of the choices of our president, I mean, I, we've never had a president I'm totally happy with, but that office, I think if I was actually going to go and meet the president of the United States, yes, I would dress up. I'd probably wear a coat and tie. Well, why wouldn't you do that in church? Well, this is why. Let me give you a couple of thoughts on this. Here you are, you're a young parent, you've got a small child. It's bedtime. You're kneeling beside their bed. They're in their pajamas. And you're, you're teaching them how to connect with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wait a second. That kid shouldn't be in PJs. That kid should be dressed up. Jerk that kid out of bed. Dress him up. You should go take a shower. You should comb your hair. You should put on your nice stuff because you're meeting with a king. We wouldn't do that. What if you're out mowing the yard? 
and just something comes in your mind, and you say, yeah, they mentioned that, that family in church. They come to your mind, and you say, man, I'm going to pray for them. They're going, maybe, you know, Carl. <laughs> We're thinking of Carl and Laura. I mean, Laura's had this knee thing. I could, I could see it. I've been driving down the road. You're, you're, out, you're probably not mowing the grass, but you might be shoveling snow this week. And you're thinking, oh, man, I, I didn't pray for Laura today. So what do you do? Well, of course, you get off the mower. You go inside and you take a shower. You put on your suit. You put on your dress. You lay makeup. Ladies, you can't pray and, and meet the king of kings without makeup. No, what do you do? You just wipe the sweat and say, Lord, bless her. What's the difference? You're driving down the road. Listen to Caleb. Song comes on. You must sing along. You say, wait a second. I can't sing along. I'm wearing Crocs and shorts. That's not appropriate attire to worship. I got to wear a suit. So I was turning on the bull and listening to the country, and I can sing whatever I want there without worshiping. So, what's the difference? If you met the president, yes, you might dress up. But what if the president was John Kennedy and you weren't just Joe Blow, you were little John John? What if the president is not the president to you? What if he's dad? Because when you and I come into the presence of the king of kings, he's not just the king. He's your dad. He's your daddy. Matter of fact, the word that Paul uses and Jesus uses is the word Abba, which is the same word that the Jewish people, the kids would call their father, meaning daddy. And I'm not saying it's wrong. Please don't, don't go out there and say, wow, the preacher says this. Don't, don't grab somebody wearing a nice suit today or, and say, well, you shouldn't be wearing that. You know? No, we're not saying that. But our attire itself is not it. God does not live in this building. He lives in us. Matter of fact, in Acts 17, it says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. So for us as a church to insist we must dress differently in the church building so we can meet God. As simply put, that's bad theology. But let's not overlook this, though. You do still see a reverence from the seraphim. So I think it's important for us to know, do not, while I don't know that we have to wear suits and ties and dress up to the nines and all that, because I think sometimes that can be very much a vanity thing and a pride thing, but do not let your attire distract others from God either. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, Some of you say we can do whatever we want to do, but I tell you that not everything may be good or helpful. We should think about others and not about ourselves. Now, I kind of, I kind of wish this was one of those services where all our young people were still in here, uh, because I want to say this, and, and obviously probably more important for the parents, because the kids are going to do what they're going to do, okay, without us giving them direction. They're going to just do whatever. Simply put, if in church, if it's too short... If it's too low, if it's too tight, it can be a distraction. And that goes for guys and gals, okay? So don't be wearing something that is just by nature going to be distracting. And mom and dad, it's our job to help our kids figure this out. I mean, we might have a church full of Swifties, but please don't teach your, kid, your daughters and sons that's how you're supposed to dress. Do not let your attire distract. Do, though, on the other hand, let your attire demonstrate your love for God. 1 Corinthians 10 says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You know, God, God deserves our best, but, he, but he's looking at the heart, not just the outside. Okay? Third thing, we can show reverence in our worship itself. Again, look at verse 2, the last part. And with 2, they were flying. The observation is simple. By flying, they were ensuring the throne was their constant focus. Two things that we mentioned earlier can really help us. Number one, do not let our activity distract others from God. Uh, we, we ask our greeters in the back, and periodically it, something happens. And at the end of the service especially, when, when we come to that invitation time, you know, we're given an invitation for people to have an encounter with God. You know, we really don't want a distraction there if we can avoid it. Uh, I know sometimes people have to leave a little early, but if, if you know you're going to have to leave early, honestly, I'd encourage you to sit in the back so that you're not going out in front of somebody who's really wrestling with a decision they have to make for God. Uh, if you have a cell phone, put it on silent. 
those kind of things. All those things can be distractions. Going in and out, checking your phone, uh, sleeping, <laughs> especially if you snore. Uh, you know, allowing your children to misbehave and things like that. I mean, we love our kids. We want our kids to be here. But we have a children's program. And, you know, if your child is young and they get a little unruly, just slip out with them. Let them, let them find their little happy place and then bring them back. That's fine. But... If we're going to worship God, we need to do it in a way that's not necessarily going to be distracting other people. There was a, a guy went to his doctor and asked him for something to help keep him from snoring. And the doctor said, hey, is the snoring disturbing his wife? He said, no, it doesn't disturb her. It embarrasses her. It's the other people in church that it disturbs. <laughs> Again. If you, if you had to get up and go right now, it wouldn't bother me a bit, okay? I, I think it might distract somebody. I might actually say something worthwhile. I don't know. But, but during that last little bit, when we get to that conclusion, when the praise team's coming up here, please, please don't let that be a time when there is a distraction. Second, though, not just don't let it be a distraction. Do let your activity demonstrate your love for God. We sang some great songs today really about this. You know, what we need to be doing as worshipers is sing. Sing. Um, somebody says, I can't sing. Well, the Bible has that covered. It says, make a joyful noise. Uh, I mean, I, I'm as noisy as anybody when it comes to that, all right? Uh, sing. Give. Giving is a part of worship. Uh, extend a warm welcome to others. Use your Bible. Use the app when we, when we go to Scripture. Pray. Say amen. Applaud. Raise your hands. Clap with the music. Come up front to pray when others come. An invitation, you know, for yourself or others, respond to that. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Therefore I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands. I mean, Paul is telling us, I want you to lift hands when you pray. Now, I don't know that God won't answer your prayers if you don't. But we need to ask ourselves sometimes, why am I resistant to expressing myself in worship? I mean, who hadn't been to a football game or a basketball game, you know, especially if you get a chance to go to Kroger Field or, or, or go to Rupp Arena, and here you are sitting there surrounded by people you've never met. You know, somebody gets a three, and we, we win the game, or we get ahead, and, you know, someone gets an interception, something exciting. What do people around you do that have never met you? They'll stand up. They'll turn them, and they'll, they'll raise their hands. They want to give you a high five because somebody can catch a pigskin. Because someone can shoot a basketball. How come, why are we reluctant to do that? When scripture tells us we should. Psalm 134 says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, don't suppress the spirit. I think that's the key. I think sometimes we are so afraid of what that person next to us is going to think. That we don't engage when the Holy Spirit is leading us to engage. You know, far, I, I never, ever want to point somebody out in, in a way, certainly it would be embarrassing, but, and I know she absolutely didn't do this to be recognized. But did you all notice that last song when we were singing? Did you, did you notice what Shelby did? I mean, and I know she didn't do it to be seen, okay? Guarantee that. But if you didn't see it, Shelby's standing over here leading a song, and she dropped down to her knees. Let's, let's be honest. Hasn't there been times when we've sung something here? And it's like we're standing and just something in you says, this is just not the posture I ought to have. And yet, how many times do we change our posture? So few. So few. Real worship says, you know what? If God says fall on your face, I'm going to fall on my face. If he says, get off your feet and get on your knees, I'm going to do it. That's real worship. And that's what we need to be doing. I tell you what, what God would do with our congregation, with your family, with your spiritual life, if we would just give that control over to him, it would be amazing. You realize that we see this picture here of these angels. And it doesn't, I mean, we know they're singing holy, 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 and, you know, and that. Do you realize... That later in the Bible, in Revelation, it tells us there's a song that we get to sing that they don't. They have a creator, okay? 
These seraphim, these cherubim, these angels, archangels, all these creatures, they were all created. They never sinned. The ones that did got booted out. They never had a chance for redemption. You and I have a song of redemption because just like Dan said in that devotion earlier, you know, God says, you know what? Compared to him, we're just a bunch of worms, but he was willing to become a worm to be one of us. To save us. We have more reason to praise God than they do. And yet we don't. Remember that passage where the people are praising Jesus and the the leaders come along and say, stop him. Stop him from doing that. And he said, if I did, the rocks would cry out. Real worship. Our responsiveness influences the response of others as well. My participation will affect somebody else. My lack of participation will very much affect somebody else as well. This happens every single week. I promise you it happens every single week. And sometimes it happens like this. Okay? There's, a, there's somebody coming. They've been listening to the Word, and the Bible says this, this Word won't come back void, and you know, during the sermon, during the invitation, maybe during the music, the Holy Spirit's working on that individual. But at the same time, I guarantee the devil is working on that person too. And let's say that person is sitting in a row where you are. And it comes time to sing the song, and we're singing that song, and they're just squirming. You've seen it. You used to see it all the time. You used to call it white knuckling. You ever seen anybody in church, you knew they wanted to come, and they're just hanging on like that, afraid they let loose, they'll just slip right into hell. It happens. But I'll tell you what can happen at the same time. Is here they are. They're thinking, man, I really want to do this. What do people think? Blah, blah, blah. It's like the devil on one shoulder and the spirit on the other, you know. And then in that row, you've got another family. And at that pivotal point, maybe instead of praying for that person down the road, because they don't even know what's going on, that family starts talking. It's just, you know what? If we slip out right now, we can beat those other people to Cracker Barrel. And at that pivotal point, I've seen it. Or someone says, hey, excuse me, and they just slip right by. And that simple act took the attention of what the Holy Spirit... I'm not saying God is not able to get past that. But folks, there is nothing more important that we do in this church any time at all than to help people have an encounter with the living God. I'm not saying it just happens on Sunday. But when it does... We need to make sure that there's nothing we do that would distract that person. Because I guarantee, there, every, there, is, there are people, I guarantee every one of you could reach around within two people and touch somebody right now that came here with a load on them that you cannot imagine. That the Holy Spirit would love for them to leave right here. Oh, they came in with a big smile on their face. You might ask them, how you doing? They give you the old grin, oh, we're doing great. But deep down, there's something God wants to do in their life. Whatever you do, don't let your lack of involvement, don't let your lack of worship or whatever be a distraction for someone meeting the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm going to have the team come. Kind of interesting, the root word for the seraphim is the word serap, S-A-R-A-P which literally means to burn. Matter of fact, the name of seraphim could be translated to the burning ones or the fiery ones. The reverence shown by the seraphim is seen in their focus on the throne, and it's because of their focus that they are on fire. What would it be like for our community, for our church, for our families, if because of our involvement in real worship, We too were on fire. Samuel Chadwick said this, Destitute of the fire of God, nothing else counts. Possessing fire, nothing else matters. I don't know what God may want to do with this message for you today. I do know there's a fellow going to come. He's going to be baptized. We're excited about that. Maybe someone else wants to say, You know what? If he can do it, I can do it. Maybe you want to come. We've got plenty of water back there. We've got plenty of clothes. Maybe someone's thinking, this is the church for us. We've been wrestling with this a while, thinking about it. Today's the day. Maybe I'm going to make this my church on today. 
more than that, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you know, the worship of others that said, man, I want some of that. I, you know, what they got, you know, it's written on their face. I want that here. Man, we'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to pray with you about that. Whatever you need is. We know we have a God who wants to meet it. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the example of real worship. Help us to realize the incredible gift it is to come into your presence. Help us to respond to that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me?
right here, you guys. I told his family they can come up here. Got a whole pack of grandkids up here. Sixteen of them. This young man is George Robinson. He he's a pretty good egg. He's also my barber, so I mean he can only do what he can do. He's not a miracle worker. He can only, he can only do what he can work with. But uh, we've been talking for a little bit, and uh, he told me that uh, he's ready to take the plunge. He's accepted Christ as a savior and uh, wants to publicly profess that to, to all of us. And and I think too, uh, he's not ashamed of this at all. He wants to be a good example for these guys right here. What a, what an honorable thing to do and the right way to do it. And so, uh, young guys, young gals, uh, this is there's no magic in this water. It's just red or go water. This right here is a turtle, you know. And that uh, that lets keeps gunky stuff from growing here, all right? So there's nothing special about that either. Uh, what's special is because your grandpa here and your dad has accepted Christ as his Savior. And that gives him eternal life. And he's showing that faith by being willing to be baptized. Because Jesus, you know, was buried and was dead for three days and came back to life after he was crucified. And this shows that we identify with that. You understand that, young man? Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to have you repeat after me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. He's the son of the living God. And he's my Lord and Savior. He's my Lord and Savior. Amen, brother. Amen. God bless you. Get down, get down this way. Ready? Yeah. Upon your confession of faith, you're now being baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in baptism. <laughs> Raised to walk. Maybe. In <laughs> newness of life. <laughs> <laughs> we do it right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> That angels are rejoicing right now. Don't let them outdo us. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for your love. You're an amazing God. We owe you everything. We give you this day and the rest of the week. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have a fantastic day.